Oh, let her finish. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Welcome to those that are here and to those that are listening to us over the internet, all over the world. We have been just overwhelmed with all of the people that have shared with us, literally from all over the world, uh, expressing their deep regret at the passing of our pastor, Steve Mitchell. Uh, the flowers here, of course, are from the service yesterday. And we, uh, we just thank you so much for joining with us in this time of, of sorrow. But at the same time, we must be about teaching, expressing, explaining, expounding God's Word. Because from the Word is how we grow and how we are challenged. From the Word is how we learn how to handle such things as we've been experiencing with our pastor. So to start out with the, the uh, scripture that I'll be sharing and that I've been assigned to teach from. Okay. Um, is James 1, 19 to 26. This is written to believers. It's already assuming that you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, that you've understood that you're a, a sinner. You have no way of making up for that. And understanding that God sent His Son to pay the penalty for our sin, that we, in receiving that gift, then become Christians. We become brothers and sisters with Jesus. We become joined into the family of God. So this scripture is written to those who believe, those who have the Spirit of God dwelling within them. The scripture is written to help us understand how we might receive power through God's Word and be able to use it appropriately to be able to grow in Christ. You see, that's our, that's our job, isn't it? We're to grow in Christ, to be more and more like Him, to be clean and useful vessels that he can use to reach others for Christ. Right. So if we're not about that, if I refuse to grow, if I refuse to spend time in God's Word, then I'm essentially saying, God, don't bother using me. Use somebody else. But you see, there are people I know that you don't know. There are people that need to know about Jesus, and the only Jesus they'll ever see is me or my wife or my children. So we must be about God's Word, teaching it, understanding it, applying it to our lives so that we can be strong. Okay, the passage we have for today is James 1, 19 through 26. I will read it here. It's in the New American Standard. Now, I had to back up. Uh, Charles shared through verses 18 last week, and it was a perfect ending for the first section of the book of James. But as God's Word is so perfect, I've got to back up and get a couple of verses from what Charles shared to include in mine to, to give the full understanding and the full feeling of the Scripture we're going to share. You'll see that as we go along. So starting out, James 1, verse 17. Every good thing given, and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. Verse 19, this you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. But prove yourselves doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. 
For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. Verse 26, If anyone thinks himself to be religious, and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Now, to understand this passage and to make an impact for it today, we've got to do a couple of things. One is, I have gone through and I've basically I've outlined it so that you can take some things that are more explanatory and you can shift those over. They're important. They're, they're like a, a built-in commentary, if you will, that God has placed in there. Now, they're still God's Word. It's still perfect. It's not like a commentary you might pick up and read that man has written, because that's not perfect. But this is perfect. But I've moved it over a little bit so that we can understand, here are the main points of this Scripture set, and these points are more explanatory. If, if hopefully that makes sense to you. So here is our, our verses in, a, uh, in an outline form. And we're going to start with, I want to call out to your attention, the word. You see, the word of truth is in verse 18. Then down in verse 21, in, in humility receive the word implanted. Then in verse 22, prove yourselves doers of the word. Then down in verse 25, but one who looks intently at the perfect law, which is God's word, the law of liberty, which is God's word. So right in the middle of this discussion of the word of truth, the word, the word, the word, the perfect law, the law of liberty, is this statement, quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. That's on a lot of your refrigerators, I suppose, on little magnets. And we use it improperly to talk about how we deal with each other. And it might be a good tool for that. I haven't really looked into it to determine is that really the right way to go or not. But I know that it's written, it's written to help us understand the Word. You see, when God's Word is open to you, in Bible study, at church, wherever you are looking into God's Word, understand that you need to be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. And we're going to talk about those things and understand a little bit more about what they mean. But I wanted you to understand this section of Scripture is talking about how we receive God's Word. Why we receive it. What do we hope to get from it? What's the impact? What's it going to do for us by listening to God's Word? Okay, That's where we're going. So first of all, Verse 19b, I guess we'd call it, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Quick to hear means you need to be here. When you have Bible study on Tuesday night, you need to be here. You have church Sunday morning. You need to make that extra effort to be here because in so doing, you honor the Lord Jesus Christ. You glorify Him and you glorify the Father in submitting yourself to something that sometimes is a little awkward. Sometimes you had a hard night the night before, you worked late. And I understand sometimes you just, you really physically can't make it. But make the effort, because that's an opportunity to give. It's just like, you know, you write your check on Sunday and, and you, you give or you, you put cash. This is an opportunity to give to the Lord. Be here. When Pastor Steve was sharing with us on Tuesday nights as he, as he went through the Bible, each thing he said would make an impact on us. And then when he preached on Sunday morning, he'd be talking about another whole passage, and some of that would come up again. And if you weren't here then, you won't really understand the impact of what he's talking about now. Does that make sense? You, you follow through with things. And to be taught well, to understand well, 
You need to be here when God's Word is open. You need to be quick to hear. Now, the other part is a little, is a little bit difficult to understand, but I want you to understand what we naturally do. See, when someone confronts me or you, we don't like being confronted, right? We don't, we don't like that. That's not really good stuff. It doesn't make us happy because it's usually too much too true someone else is sharing with us. But what we do is we, 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 make it, we quickly make excuses. We, we, well, it's, 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 there's a reason why I did that. And as we do that, we're building the foundation for a wall that we finish off when, we, when the part about being slow to anger because you'll use that wall to build up a, a reason why you don't have to listen to what was shared and then you, you block what that person was actually trying to share with you. Um, silly example. Somebody comes up to me and says, you know, I really don't like the way you tie your tie. You, you should use a, what were some, a Windsor. And the Windsor, the one that goes kind of cockeyed, you should use a Windsor knot, especially when you're preaching, because that's just, and I'm thinking, what are you, what are you talking about? My dad taught me how to tie this tie, you know. And I start, and I start see, I, I, I should be slow to speak. But see, I'm quick to speak to myself. Tell me why. Well, that's not wrong. That's wrong. And then I get angry about, well, how dare him come to me? He didn't even wear a tie. Why should he be talking to me about how I do mine? So see, I, I, I get angry, and I build this wall. And now I've, I've set myself aside from being able to hear what it was this brother was sharing with me. Now, I've picked something silly like a tie because it doesn't matter. Because I didn't want to stomp on anybody's toes by mentioning what the New Testament actually says we should do and shouldn't do. But when you're quick to hear, you're here, slow to speak. When you hear something that goes against the grain with you and it's coming from God's Word, recognize it as such and be still. Give it the ability to germinate in your heart and in your mind. And allow yourself to think through, why, why might that be a positive thing? Why might that be important for me? Don't build the wall of protection that says you're not going to listen to it. And by doing so... You're allowing yourself then not to get angry about it, and not to and not to uh, not to just dismiss it, and say I'm going to have nothing to do with that. Now, sometimes people people come to you with good things and and not so good things. But God's word always comes to you with things that are proper. If you're challenged by God's word, don't speak against it in your heart. And build the wall and become angry and dismiss it. Think about it in your heart. And if you really have difficulty with it, go to someone you trust that understands God's Word, or go to one of your elders, or go to your pastor. Those of you online, go to someone that, that, that you know understands God's Word and see if they can help you through the difficulty you're having. But don't let the action dismiss God's Word. Remember, be slow to speak, be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Now, verse 20, I've indented because it's talking about this anger. It's not a main point. It's, it's a subset because it's talking about anger. It says, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Well, that fits right in with what I was just sharing with you, right? Because then the anger actually dismisses God's word rather than working with it. Verse 21, therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness. So we're dealing with this process of God's Word, how we receive it, be quick to hear, and slow to, slow, to, slow to speak and slow to anger is how we receive it, how we internalize what God's Word has to say. First of all, verse 21, you have to set aside all filthiness, and you have to set, set aside all the remains of wickedness. Now, filthiness kind of deals with our sin, things that are going on within our lives, things we've accepted. There's little things. You know, it's just a little. It's just a, it's just a little white lie. Those things that we accept that grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger. So that's talking about the sins that we allow. Wickedness has to do with about our thought processes and how we think about things and those, those, the way we think that causes us to be able to think differently about the things that God allows into our lives. So first of all, we need to be a clean vessel, okay? For the God's Word to work, you've got to be a clean vessel. How do you do that? I'm not a clean vessel. I'm a filthy vessel. Yes, I am. And yes, so are you. But you can fix that by confessing it to God. 
When you confess your sins, he will forgive you your sins. And then you're the clean vessel in which he can work. Next bullet point, in humility, receive the word of God implanted. A little bit about what we talked about, about being quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. The very word of God is able to save your souls. It is truth. It is the Lord Jesus. He is the word. So be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Put aside all filthiness and what remains of wickedness, and in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. Now, it goes on as a subset of the word implanted, and it talks about prove yourselves doers of the word. That means you've really received it. You've, you know, you're really, I'm really thinking about how he told me to tie my tie. I didn't just dismiss it. I'm thinking, man, is there anything positive? Would people think negatively of me because I tie it a certain way? Would I be associated with a certain group? So I'm following through with my silliness of, of, of a tie, but I want you to see the thought process. It affects us. So prove yourselves doers of the word. You're receiving it. You're going to start doing it, and not merely hearers who delude themselves. You see, the hearer who deludes himself is the person that comes and hears that's it. They don't apply it to their lives. They don't change anything about how they do things or how they think or how they talk, how they act. They're just hearers. They're not doers. Well, how do you become a doer? Well, it takes effort. We're going to talk about it. It takes effort on your part. You have to decide you're going to do something about it. It isn't just osmosis. You know, you remember the, the, the stories about the, the kid that before finals night, he took the, took the book they were studying, put it under his pillow, and slept on it, hoping it would just kind of seep through, you know. Well, guess what? <laughs> it doesn't work that way, right? It takes effort. Okay, prove yourselves doers of the word, not merely hearers. Now, another subset talking about that hearers and doers of the word. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. So you get a mirror, you look at yourself. It's going to describe how you're a, just a hearer and not a doer. It says, for once he has looked at himself and then gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. Uh, you've forgotten. Did I have my hair? Did I comb my hair this morning? Did, did I? Did I? You know, is, is there any lettuce in my teeth from lunch? You know that kind of thing. You, you, you've forgotten it. You forgot to look for that. You know, so that's the example. Looking at your face in a mirror is an example of, you know, you, you go away and you forget what it was. 24, for once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. 25, but one who, who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, looks intently at the Bible. What's intently mean? Well, you have intentions about it, intently. You have the intention of looking at it, studying it, understanding it, internalizing it, allowing it, giving it permission to change your life because God's Word will. It's supernatural. You know, it's like Popeye popping the spinach. and talk. It changes him, right? God's Word is like that. It's your spinach, you know, and you got it with you all the time because as you memorize it and think about it, you've got it right there to use as a sword, sword of the Lord. So, and abides by it, it says. What's abides by it? Well, that means you're, it doesn't mean you got it. doesn't mean you've nailed it. doesn't mean you've, you've fixed that part. But you're abiding. You're hanging in there. You're staying with it. You're, you're, you're working towards taking that little bit of knowledge that you've gained from God's Word. And you're saying, Lord, help me. Help me to make that part of who I am. Because, Lord, I want to please you. You've done so much for me. Can you imagine that God who created the universe, God who knows everything, that he would care about me or you? We're not even a speck. And we're sinful in all our ways. We're going to talk a little bit about how sinful we are because most people think, well, I don't know too much bad. I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty good person. You know, I go to church. I, I'm a, I go to church every Christmas and Easter. Every, I, every year. You can count on me. I'm a good Christian. Well, look at it from God's point of view. God sees the sin that is in you. And it has to be done away with because God can't, God can't have fellowship with you unless that sin is removed. We'll talk about that later. 
Okay. Abides in it. Not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. So the word promises that you'll be blessed in what you do if you follow through with this. Now, again, we talked about quick to hear. Here's an example out of Acts 17.10. It says, The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. 11. Now, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with eagerness, examining the Scriptures daily to see if these things were so. You see, eagerness, receive God's word. And how do you determine whether something in God's word is true or what it means? What do you use to compare God's word with? God's word, right? You go from one part of Scripture that you do understand and know, and you look at the Scripture that you don't quite understand, and you say, well, how do those two fit together? Because I know this is true. And I'm trying to figure this one out. Well, it might be this. Well, yeah, but that wouldn't square with this that I know in Scripture. So you, you can work it out yourself. That and prayer and the Holy Spirit will guide you. But that's the, the idea of being quick to hear. Now, there is a component in that you need to be here. You need to be here. I'll give an example of our Tuesday nights. They used to have 30 people here, and now we're down to less than, well, about 10, I suppose. So consider that. You online, consider getting together with other Christians, joining together with them, and fellowshipping together, encouraging each other in God and in His love for you, and in your love for Him, and in your love for each other, so that you can be used in all ways by the Lord. So there's quick to hear. Slow to speak. Now, here's an example of Job, and we did this, I think it was on a Tuesday night. We did it before. Again, see, if, if you were here then or if you heard that message, then this will be review for you, and it won't be something new. But Job in chapter 40, he's gone through all these chapters, all these friends that have come and told him how horrible he is and how he just needs to, uh, needs to admit before God how rotten he is. And he says, I haven't done anything wrong. But he is a little upset with God because of what's, what's befallen him. And God answers him in chapter 40, and he says, Shall the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? He who rebukes God, let him answer it. You see what God, how God considered what Job, all these things that happened to Job, and Job's just saying, Lord, why me? Why did this happen to me? I've been righteous before you. And God says, he's contending with me. He's correcting me. He's rebuking me. Are those strong words? Can you imagine... If God says that about Job, how does he look at me? How does he look at you? Oh, my. He goes on. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, this is a right response. Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer you? I lay my, I lay my hand over my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer, Job says. Yes, twice, but I will proceed no further. God's got a different idea, he says in verse 6. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Would you indeed annul my judgment? Would you condemn me? All that, here's the jewel, all that you might be justified. You see, God, Job needed to receive all this and understand that God was going to be justified through it. And yet, he wasn't able to get that done. We have a tendency to want to be justified. You ever had somebody come at you and it dark and they flash their lights at you and yours are on dim? What do you do? Blink, blink, blink. Wrong. So what am I doing? What am I saying? See, buddy, see, I didn't have them on dim. I had them on bright, right? We're justifying ourselves. We want to make sure that guy knows that we weren't really on bright. Just a silly example, but we do it. See, I just want you to see that this wanting to be justified is in us. It's part of the sin nature. And God places it pretty high because he talks to Job. Would you contend with me, correct me, rebuke me? Would you annul my judgment? Would you condemn me all that you might be justified? So when we speak, it's a powerful thing. In our scripture about, being, about uh, receiving God's word, quick to hear, slow to speak, we need to be slow to speak in our own hearts and minds, right? Because we'll send ourselves over a path that can go to anger and build this wall so we will not receive what God has to share with us. We need to not do that. Be open. Meditate on God's Word and let God's Word direct you how to think about it. 
Slow, anger. It's wrong to be angry at God. Anger at God is a result of an inability or unwillingness to trust God even when we do not understand what he is doing. See, that's where Job was. He didn't understand what God was doing, and he let it take him over to anger. Have you ever been angry? Have you ever been really angry? Here's the key. Have you ever been really, really angry and then found out later that you were totally wrong in what you thought was going on? If someone came and corrected you and said, oh, you didn't understand, this is what was going on behind the scenes, and you thought, oh, my. Oh, my. Don't be angry with God. Because guess what? He's all knowledge. He's all wisdom. He's all powerful. He knows it all before it even happens. God is God. Anger at God is essentially telling God that he has done something wrong. You ever thought about that? You think, Lord, how could you have done that? Lord, why did you allow that to happen? Lord, Lord, what are we doing? First of all, we're justifying ourselves because, see, we are so wise. If God had just checked with us before he did that, you know, I mean, see, that's the attitude we have in our heart. I mean, I know that sound, that's grossly horrible, but that's the attitude we have within ourselves. I'm just putting it, laying it bare. So if you understand that, it might cause you to look back and think about, do I get angry with God's word, which might cause you to come back and think about, did I really think through that thing that God's word shared, which allows you to come back to, am I really there all the time for God's word? Am I really there to understand and learn what he has to teach me where I am? It all fits together. Oh, I didn't, get, I didn't read it all, did it? Does, does God understand when we are angry, frustrated, or, dis, or disappointed with him? Yes. He knows our hearts. He knows how difficult and painful life in this world can be. And it can be, right? I mean, we just lost our pastor. We're in pain. God knows. God has a plan. We don't know what that plan is yet. Hopefully we will soon. Does that make it right to be angry with God? Absolutely not. Instead of being angry with God, we should pour out our hearts to him in prayer and trust that he is in control of his perfect plan, right? That's why we don't want to get angry about God's word. That's why we don't want to speak God's word to us against God's word in our hearts. That's why we need to be receiving God's word. We need to be here. So remember the context. Word of truth, word implanted, the word, the word, the perfect law, the law of liberty. And right in the middle of that is be quick to hear, be slow to speak, be slow to anger. Now, after we've done all that, God, in his blessedness, gives us an example. You know, he does this a lot in Scripture as you look at it. He'll, he'll list these things you should do or shouldn't do, and then he gives you a great example. Well, here's our example, verse 26. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. If you think yourself to be religious, you do, right? I mean, you're here. Obviously, you do. I mean, I don't mean that in a negative way. You think yourself to be really, you're following the Lord. You're trying to as best you can. But it says, if you don't bridle your tongue, you're deceiving your own heart. And your religion is, strong word, worthless, has no value, has no worth. Why would he give us that as an example? What, what, is it that, is it that, Understanding bridling the tongue is so important. Well, he's been talking about be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. He's talking a little bit about how we use our tongue and how we think. And now he's taking it into a broader area and said, if you don't bridle your tongue, it means to tame your tongue. It means to control your tongue. Is yours in control? Is mine? No, it's not. Go ahead to James 3, verse 5 and 8. It says, So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. The tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. 
for every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Now, wait a minute. You see, this is one of those instances when God really needed to have me by his side when he wrote his word. Because, see, this doesn't make any sense. And I would have helped him to understand that. You see, you can't tell me that you cannot tame the tongue. And at the same time, in verse 26, tell me, if you don't bridle your tongue, your religion is worthless. Look, it didn't make sense. What, what's God talking about? Why, why would he say something like that? It's, it, does the right hand know what the left hand's doing? What's the answer to this? Yes, God knows, right? But where's the problem, right? Where's the problem? It's me understanding. So let's, let's think about that. That sounds like an impossibility, doesn't it? Let's think about it. When Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So see, what the mouth speaks comes out of what's really in the heart. A lot of times you say, you bluster something out. You say, oh, I was just kidding. You just really nailed that person, but you really didn't want it to be serious. So you say, oh, I was just kidding. A lot of times truth comes out that way. Right? A lot of times our own, our own heart is revealed. Well, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, Matthew 12, 34. He meant that consistently sinful words and deeds are indicative of a sinful heart. How do we use that? Rather than always giving people the benefit of the doubt, talking about really other Christians, because you can't expect the world to act like us, right? The world's going to act like the world. They're going to follow their father, the devil. They don't want to admit that, but that's true. Their father is the devil. Our father is the Lord. We must follow him. Okay, rather than always giving people the benefit of the doubt, we should, would do well to recognize the fruit we observe and respond accordingly. Being a fruit inspector does not mean we consider ourselves to be without sin. It does mean that we are realistic about whom we trust, whom to trust, and whom we allow to exert influence over us and the people for whom we are responsible. The tongue really only reveals the heart. Now, the second part of that is we need to understand that the people we trust, be listening to it. Be a fruit inspector. Because if someone's tongue is out of line a lot of times, what's that telling you? Their heart's out of line too. So Jesus is sharing with us that the tongue only reveals the heart, right? So the tongue cannot be tamed, James 3, the tongue only reveals the heart, Matthew 12, the heart can be changed. So you see, when we change the heart, the tongue comes along with it. And that's why the man who doesn't manage his tongue, the man who doesn't bridle his tongue, his religion is worthless. Because it really means his heart hasn't changed. You see, we need to be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, as we receive God's word, allow it to change our heart, and in so doing, we just naturally learn to bridle our tongue. So we can't say to ourselves, tongue be bridled in whatever way we want to do it. It won't work. The tongue will always reveal the heart. Right? Psalm 51, create me a pure heart, O God. Ezekiel 36, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. Isaiah 57, for this is what the high and exalted one says, He who lives forever, whose name is holy, I live in a high and holy place, but also with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit, that's us, believing and obeying, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. So you see, God's word doesn't contradict itself, does it? It just gives us a better view of what's going on. And see, it all comes back to how we receive God's Word. That's the only way we can change. And think about it. We, we, we handle God's Word so flippantly. I mean, it sits around our house. We don't pay attention to it. Oh, we, we carry it on Sunday because it makes us look good, right? Matter of fact, get a big Bible so everybody will notice it. You know, bring the... Bring the family Bible. You know, everybody will think, wow, he's, he's mature. God's Word 
God, the creator of the universe, the one who created your heart, your pumpy thing, and your, your heart, the, the idea of how you think, and the, your eyes and how they work, and, and nerve endings and how they work, and how I can move my finger and move my foot. God, that created all that, wrote a letter to you, Christian. Treat it that way. This is what God wants to say to you. And it'll speak to whatever situation you're in. Marital difficulties, difficulties with whatever bad habits you might have, God's Word will speak to those things. And if you are quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to anger, God will meld that together just to meet your situation where you are right now in this very hour today. Online, wherever you are, whatever your situation, God's Word has the answer. Be quick to hear. So, if anyone thinks himself to be religious, yet does not bridle his tongue, his own, he, this man's religion is worthless. What about if you do bridle your tongue? Now your religion has value. What are you showing God? I'm willing to learn. I'm willing to submit. I'm willing to obey. I'm willing to listen to what your word says. In verse 21, putting aside all filthiness, it's really, really, it's kind of about things that we do, sins. And the word for wickedness is more about our thoughts and those things that affect us. You've got to be clean in receiving God's word before it'll have its effect that God wants it to have. So if I take away the explanatory stuff, Understand, this is all God's Word. I'm not saying take it away, don't pay attention to it. It's perfect, and it helps to understand, but these are the bullet points, if you will. Everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Not talking about you and your how you communicate with your neighbor. It's talking about you and how you communicate with God through His Word. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, you've got to clean, you got to make things clean before you can receive that which is perfect. In humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. But prove yourselves doers of the word, not just hearers. And then you'll find yourself fitting into this, this, this picture of anyone who thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart. Deceives his own heart, right? We do it to ourselves. This man's religion is worthless. Now verse 27 Pure and undefiled religion. Pure, it's perfect, there's nothing wrong with it. It's undefiled, no one can find anything wrong with it. It's pure and it's undefiled religion in the sight of God is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress. Now why is that the example? Is everybody supposed to go out and visit orphans and widows? Is that what God's Word is saying? See, what is it that orphans and widows have in common? They don't have somebody close to them. They don't have parents. They don't have a spouse. They don't have that one that God's placed beside them. So to visit them, they have nothing to give back to you. The widow and the orphan, they can't return the, the great favor of you coming to visit them. They have nothing to give you. There's nothing to show for it. We don't have a badge that says, I visited orphans this week, right? Or, or a special tie that said, right? We don't have that. No one knows but you, God. That's pure and undefiled religion, right? So he says, visit them in their distress. That's those that need it, those who are having difficulty. And also, keep yourselves unstained of the world. Now that's a tough, because the world affects us so much. Now, this is a little story about a perfect needle. Now, I'm talking about a needle that's specially prepared and polished. They're going to use it for brain surgery or heart surgery. Or this is the best we can do, right? The needle is this needle. Okay, this is from Charles Spurgeon in a sermon he had. He said, bring me that microscope. I have just now put the wing of a butterfly under it. That's God's work. And as I enlarge it, I discover no imperfection, but more and more of marvelous beauty. Everything is just perfect. It's like, it's like looking at a crystal or something. It's just perfect. That butterfly's wing under the microscope becomes most wonderful. And I worship God as I gaze upon his handiwork. You understand what he's saying? Look at that which God has made that is perfect. 
Now he says, take the butterfly away now and put your needle in its place under the microscope. What? This has been a rough bar of iron. You ever seen close-up pictures of a, of a needle or even a razor blade? Think of a razor blade and it's so rough and cutting those valleys. And, you know, when you really look at it, it's, it's way imperfect. This is wretched workmanship. It does not seem appropriate for delicate work, such as man's manufacture, the best of it. You see, the best that you can do, you're just a bar of iron. You're not a razor blade. So the best that we can do is not enough. We've got to allow God's Word to change us. You see, God is so pure. This is really important. God is so pure, he cannot endure what is defiled. He can't allow me in his presence or you. He's too pure. God is so perfect that he cannot enter into fellowship with that which has a blemish. So how, does that, how do I fix that? You see, that's why the Scripture goes into such depth of telling us that when we receive Christ as our Savior, we become we, he puts his perfection on us. It's imputed is the Bible word for it. When, when God sees Jim Wilson, he doesn't see the wretched sinner that I am. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. What a blessed thing, because see, now I can have fellowship with God. Without that perfection, I could not. God cannot entertain sin. He cannot fellowship with what has the blemish. Here's a bit of an example. This is from Isaiah. Isaiah was there, he's, he was in heaven, and he found himself to be woefully inadequate. He says, woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Isaiah 6. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So you see what he's doing? He's like, oh, no, God is here. I, I, I'm a man, I'm unclean. Then one of the seraphim flew to me. Now these seraphim are in the, by the throne of God. They got, you know, six wings, two they, two they, two they fly, two they cover themselves because they're, they're ashamed of themselves before the holiness of God. Now, they're holy creatures. They're perfect, but they're not holy like God is holy. Well, it says, the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. The altar represents God's holiness. They took it from the altar with tongs because they dared not touch the altar of God. Now, could they handle coals? Sure. It says, he touched my, he says, Taken from the altar of tongue, he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Uh, it's not clear here in the in the version that I put, but he used he brought it with his hand and touched Isaiah's lips. So he couldn't touch the altar, he could handle the coals. That's an idea of the holiness of God. This is the God we're dealing with. How do we approach him? The iniquity of holy things. In God's picture of how he, he dressed Aaron with the first priesthood, Aaron had a turban on. And it said, God says, you shall make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it like the engraving of a signet, holy to the Lord. Okay. And it shall be on Aaron's forehead, and Aaron shall bear any guilt from the holy things that the people of Israel consecrate as their holy gifts. You see, your holy things... The best that you can do falls short. But because of this holiness to the Lord up there, God was able to receive, because of that, receive the gifts that the Israelites brought to God, even though they were woefully inadequate. We don't have a, I don't have a turban on this morning, do I? Our pastor, when he's here, he didn't wear a turban with a gold. How, how, what, what happens for us? We have the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that is, is the filter, if you will, that filters out that which is unholy and transmits onto the Father that which is holy. Well, a lot of you might say, well, I'm not really a, a bad sinner. I, I do pretty good. I mean, I'm, I'm way better than Joe. Oh, there's hope there's nobody here named Joe. I'm way better than Joe. Oh, there is. I'm sorry, Joe. <laughs> there's nobody here better than Sam. Nobody here but Sam. So, you get my point. We compare ourselves to one another, right? So I'm better than him, so therefore I'm okay. Wrong. Your comparison with God. So our iniquities, according to Spurgeon, our public worship, hypocrisy. That's the bringing the big Bible that you haven't read all week. You dust it off so it'll look nice for everybody else to see. right? We do this, right? We're hypocrites. We all are. 
formality. We value the formality of the worship service way be better than if someone has something they really need to present. No, no, that's, that's not, it's, it's not written on here. You can't do that, right? Formality, right? That's wrong. Lukewarmness. Are you lukewarm? Wow. We should scratch that. Let's, let's not deal with that. Let's just forget about that one because that's too, that's too close to the heart, right? Irreverence. Are you ever irreverent? Wandering of heart. During the sermon, have you been wandering? You've been thinking, that's all iniquity. You see, when we view God, and, and you have an opportunity to, to view God, well, today through me speaking, not through me, but because of God's word, right? It's to honor God's word. To the, when we see God, we just need to be, I don't know how to describe it. It's like if a flaming angel appeared before you and you'd be, your eyes wide open and your hands out and you just couldn't look away. You couldn't think about anything. Your phone, you couldn't even hear the phone ring and you didn't know somebody on Facebook had texted you. You couldn't see anything but God. That's worship that God can receive. Anything else is irreverence. You see, you're guilty. I'm guilty. Forgetfulness of God. How much can you go through the day? How much do you remember God and the things that you do? He wants you to. Why? Because you learned it in God's Word because you didn't get angry. You didn't speak to yourself negatively about it, and you were here. You were quick to hear the Word of God. It caused your heart to change, and therefore your tongue changed, right? Our work for the Lord, our desire to surpass others. You come and you dig a ditch for the Lord and say, Whew, well, I did a great job. I'd, way better than Joe would have done. Okay, <laughs> okay, right? See what we do? We, 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 we build ourselves up. My blessing is gone. We tend to compare ourselves to others. The desire to, to do better than them. We're selfish, careless, slackness, unbelief. What a massive amount of defilement is here. Our private devotions. Okay, now, now I quit preaching and went to meddling. Right? Our private devotions. Don't mess with that, buddy. Well, are they lax? Or, first of all, are they even there? Do you have a time you spend with God every day? Doesn't matter when. God's Word doesn't say when. It says two. Not two o'clock. It says two. Do it. Right? Coldness. Are you cold? Are you, do you neglect it sometimes? Sleepiness. Do you do it in a time when you kind of, you're sleepy and you're not paying too much attention and you're just kind of going through some verses and you're just reading it, but you're not understanding it? What a mountain of dread, of dead earth is there. So, it all comes back to God's Word. Be quick to hear. Be here. Be with other people that are teaching and understanding God's Word. Be slow to speak when you hear something that you need to work on, something that God's, the Holy Spirit pricks in your heart. Be slow to speak and therefore slow to anger or wrath. The idea just means a total disavowance of something that was said. I reject that. See, that's what speaking to yourself negatively does. It sends you in the path of that. Just like the justified when somebody blinks their blinker and you go, blink, blink, I didn't do it. Well, receiving God's words that way. If you allow yourself to speak negatively about it, you'll start building that wall and all of a sudden you'll, be, you'll reject it. Don't reject it. Don't build the wall. Receive it. Why? Because God's word's perfect. That's why. To put aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness. Prove yourselves doers of the word, not just hearers. Bridle your tongue. Show God that you are a religious person. I know that's not a word to use. You know, we're not we're not religious. We're, we're we uh, what does it say? We don't. Um, I can't think of the right words to say. Um, we're not religious. We're, we're believers. We have interaction with God. We're not just joining a group. But be full of Jesus. Sorry, went backwards. So, again, for today, the word of truth, the word, the word, the word, the perfect law, the law of liberty. That's where this verse belongs. Quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger.
It's not in the middle of a section about how to deal with your fellow man. It's in a section that's talking about how to deal with God's Word. Let me pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for being able to have your Word, to look into it, to apply it to our lives. Lord, I pray that you would uh, guide and direct in our hearts, that you would allow us to worship you by learning to obey you, by learning to hear your word, and to receive it, not to be speak negatively of it and then reject it. Help us, Lord. We need your help. We are frail creatures, and we tend to do that which is exactly the opposite of what you would want us to do. We pray that you would Help us to apply your word. Help us to continue to worship you as the week goes on. Help us to be full of you, to overflowing, so that others might be challenged. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.